Hello there, Project Data Scientists, and welcome to another tutorial. Today, we're going to be diving into pandas. Pandas, uh, not the animal, pandas the Python library. This is one of the most commonly used data science libraries in Python. Uh, if you're doing data science with Python, you're definitely using this. And if you're interviewing for a job, they're going to expect you to know this. This tutorial is going to go through a ton of different pandas functionality. Uh, it's, it's a perfect tutorial for anyone who has never used pandas before, although I do expect you to have some Python knowledge. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be walking through you know, how to use Python. Um, we're really gonna be diving into pandas the library today. All right, so let's walk through specifically what we're gonna be doing in this video. So step one, we're gonna create a virtual environment using Conda. This is a very important step. A lot of people might not know how to do this or might skip it, but super important. So we're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna go download and load the data. We're gonna inspect our data. Uh, and then we're going to discuss a couple of the core pandas objects so it's pretty important to know the difference between the series the panda series and the pandas data frame so we'll talk about that and then we're going to go through three different sections here and each section we're going to answer a bunch of real questions about the data so we're going to be question driven here so section number one we're just going to work with one data set and answer a bunch of questions, ask and answer a bunch of questions. Section number two, we're going to combine multiple data sets and ask and answer a bunch of questions. And then section number three is we're going to, is we're going to um, be analyzing data from the multiple data sets. So section two here is actually more about just combining the data to get it to the point where we can then ask some questions. And then we are gonna cover a lot in this tutorial, but uh, I know that there is always more to learn. So I'm gonna leave you with some items for further learning because I think that, you know, this is a good starting place, but there's always more that you can dive into. And I definitely wanna leave you with some things that you can learn after this. So project data science is all about learning through doing. So that's exactly what we're gonna do here. So rather than just watching this video, uh, I expect you to be following along, so definitely be at your computer if you can. Definitely be ready to follow along with this tutorial because you learn better through doing. So let's go ahead and get started. The data set that we're going to be using today is kind of an interesting one. It is uh, We're going to be getting it from Kaggle here but Kaggle world happiness. This is a data set about world happiness. I think we all can agree that being happy, being healthy is one of the most important things, if not maybe the most important thing, maybe the best metric to measure life by is how healthy all of us are and how happy all of us are. So this data set, comes from the World Happiness Report. This is a landmark survey of the state of global happiness. So this is a pretty big topic. Obviously, this data set is taking a very high level view at it. And it's using different information like, uh, let, let's see what kind of information it's using here. So the happiness scores and rankings use data from the Gallup World Poll. The scores are based on answers to the main life evaluation question asked in the poll. The question known as the Cantrill Ladder, well, Cantrill Ladder, uh, asks respondents to think of a ladder with the best possible life for them being a 10 and the worst possible life being a zero and to rate their own current lives on that scale. So the scores are nationally representative samples, da 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 da. The columns, so there, so there are some columns in this data set economic production, social support life expectancy, so how long you live, um, freedom, so like how free are you, absence of corruption and generosity. So these are some of the things that they think contribute to happiness and, uh, you know, whether or not these are the best metrics to go by, these are the ones we're going to have in this data and these are the ones we're going to look at. So this, this actually, this is a little interesting point here, dystopia, what is dystopia? So this is something that the researchers use. This is a hypothetical country that has values equal to the world's lowest national averages for each of the six factors. So basically, you take the worst scores on all of these things, 
and you create a hypothetical country with all of those worst scores and we're going to call that country dystopia and that country has the world's least happy people and it says here that that's just to have a benchmark against which all the other countries can be favorably compared so i think that is enough information for us to go ahead and get started so go to kaggle go to the the world happiness data set here if you don't have a kaggle account already uh, you'll probably have to create one and then we just click download for this data and here is our data set here i'll go ahead and open this up worldhappiness.zip and uh, my computer went ahead and unzipped this here so i have five looks like we have five different years worth of data so let's go ahead and pop open this 2019 data and just kind of see what it looks like we're going to do this all in pandas as well by the way but it's always good to start off if you can with just looking at a little slice of your data in excel or something like that so we have a bunch of countries we have their scores. I believe this is that whole Cantrell ladder thing. And then we've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the six measures that they were just talking about. We've got GDP or the economic output. We have some measure of social support. Not sure what that measure is. We could look more deeply into that if we want. Um, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and perceptions of corruption. So let's go ahead and make a new little project directory for ourselves. So I'm going to hop into a terminal and I am currently in my home directory and you'll notice that I have this folder here, project data science, and I'm going to CD change directories into that. I'm going to make a new directory in here. Let's call it, uh, let's call it pandas tutorial world happiness there we go we'll call it something like that so let's change directories into here and uh and now if i do ls you'll notice that there are no files in here currently i'm going to use the the move command mv to move from my downloads folder so you notice i'm doing home tilde forward slash download so this is the home directory i'm going to my downloads folder if I type in W and then hit tab, it should pull up the world happiness folder, which it does, which is here in my downloads. And I'm gonna move that directory, move that folder to dot. And the dot just means move it to this folder. Now, if I do LS, you'll notice that here's my world happiness directory. And you'll notice that it actually just disappeared over here. So what I'm showing you, if you're not used to this, would highly recommend that you, that you practice getting used to working in a terminal like this, especially as a data scientist. Uh, this is something that you are going to have to do quite a bit. And these are some of the most basic kind of simplest command line commands that I use every day whenever I am working on things. So now if I do ls world happiness, let's take a look at what's in this directory and you'll see that here are our five files. So we are good to go. We've created a project directory pandas tutorial world happiness we've moved our data into this directory and uh, let's go ahead I'm just going to clean up this zip file close that out all right now we are about to open up a Jupyter notebook but to do that I'm going to do what every good data scientist should do and create a new virtual environment so virtual environments this is another very important topic for data science. Basically, we're creating a new, uh, you know, let's just jump over here really quick. We'll look at virtual environment Python. Let's see if there's a good image here that we can. So here's a, here's a nice, oh, it's, that's kind of tiny, but so a virtual environment is basically just a folder that wraps up all of your Python packages and your libraries and a, and a whole separate little Python installation into a nice, neat folder. Now, why would you do this? Well, uh, this actually, this, this image gives a good example. If you have, if you have Python three dot something that you're working on, maybe usually, um, here, but then maybe you have a project where you need Python 
two dot something, or maybe maybe you need two different versions of one of the packages that we're going to be using, like pandas. Here's actually the little pandas logo there that you can see. Uh, if you're just working off of a single Python installation, like let's say you've got just this folder over here, well then you're not going to be able to work on both of these projects at once because they have conflicting dependencies. They've got conflicting versions of things that they need. This is why it's best practice to use a virtual environment. And a virtual environment just creates a new installation, keeps it nice and separate, and we can install whatever we want over here in this folder. And we use this folder for that project. And then if we ever need to, we can delete this folder and just kind of blow it all away and just then start over. So, uh, so we are going to create a new virtual environment using Conda. Now, if you don't have Conda installed, or maybe if you don't even have Python installed, hopefully you have Python installed, but go here to mini Conda. This is a great, pretty small version of the, the, the popular Anaconda, um, the Anaconda bundle that has all, that has Python and all of the different data science libraries in here. It's the Anaconda is really big though. Anaconda comes with a ton of stuff. Miniconda comes with basically just the, the basics comes with Python comes with Conda and you can install everything else that you need from there. You can install pandas from there. You can install numpy and scikit-learn and anything else that you need using conda here so if you don't have conda installed go install mini conda really quick shouldn't take you very long and then you can create a virtual environment like this so what we do is we do conda create dash in to give it a name so let's let's maybe call this pandas tutorial so we create our virtual environment like this and we can go ahead if we want and specify some of the things we want to install. So I'm going to say I want to install Jupyter because we want to run this all in Jupyter Notebooks. I'm going to install Pandas um, because this is a Pandas tutorial. We need Pandas. And then I've got a few other things that I usually like to install as well, like Matplotlib and NumPy. And you know these, like NumPy comes installed with Pandas. So we don't technically have to say this, but I like to be explicit about it. And, uh, you know, let's just go ahead and start with that. So this is going to create a new, nicely packaged up virtual environment for us to work in. And then we'll be able to launch Jupyter Notebooks and get on our way with learning some pandas. So I'll type in Y here to proceed with installing Jupyter and pandas and all of those dependencies, all of the Python libraries that pandas and jupyter and matplotlib depend on and this should finish in just a second all right so our conda virtual environment finished creating so now what i do uh the way that you test which python you're using and which jupyter so i'll type which python right now and you'll see that the python version i'm currently using is in this folder, root folder. So that's what that forward slash is, Anaconda3, bin Python. So this, if I run Python, this is what's going to run, this Python right here. Now, let me activate Conda activate pandas tutorial. So I activate pandas tutorial. Now, if I run which Python, boom. We're running a different Python here. So this this Python is in con or Anaconda 3 INVS. And so INVS stands for environments, as in virtual environment. Uh, Pandas tutorial, which you notice conveniently is the name that we called our virtual environment, bin and Python. So this creates kind of a, a little mimicked version. It sort of looks like this path, right? Anaconda 3 bin Python. But now we have a virtual environment. So it's pandas tutorial bin Python. And this version of Python is going to have just the packages that we just installed and nothing else. So if my full version of Anaconda had, you know, a thousand different Python packages installed, well, this virtual environment that we just created only has these um, as well as the standard. Python packages. 
Also, if I type which Jupiter, which Jupiter for Jupiter notebooks, you'll see this is also in our virtual environment. So we are good to go. I am going to go ahead and type Jupiter notebook and then the ampersand. And this ampersand here just runs Jupyter Notebooks in the background so that if we need to keep using this terminal, like a little ls here, we can, we can keep doing that. So this is how I like to run Jupyter Notebooks in my own terminals with that little ampersand there at the end. So you'll notice that Jupyter Notebooks popped open here in a new tab. So uh, it's going to run in your browser like this, and it's going to run in the directory that you launched it in. And now we can do new Python 3 notebook, and we have a nice Jupyter notebook here where we can run our commands. So this is looking pretty good. I'm going to create a new markdown cell here. I type M for markdown. I'll hit enter to get into the cell and create a, a heading one with this with this. Uh, this little hashtag pound symbol there. And I'll say, welcome to the pandas tutorial with project data science. We're going to learn through doing. All right, uh, let's go ahead and name this. I'll name this pandas tutorial world happiness data. Make sure I do command S or control S to save there and we have a Jupyter notebook up and running and if i go back over here to our terminal hit enter a couple times and then type ls you'll see that here is our notebook in this folder that we are working with all right let's go back over here so a few of the things that i like to do whenever i first get into Jupyter notebooks is i like to load the extension auto reload and then i like to specify auto reload too. This doesn't matter as much because we're not going to be we're not going to be using any scripts that we're importing here. Um, so actually I might go ahead and leave these out for today. Uh, and don't worry if you know what if you don't know what those mean, you can do a little bit of research if you want. There's also one that I usually like to put up here which is matplotlib inline. This just help oh matplotlib in matplotlib matplotlib in line and this is just a nice thing to help with the plotting inside of the notebooks um so let's go ahead and import pandas so you will notice that in the python community we have decided or somebody decided or maybe the pandas creator decided that we are always going to import the package pandas as pd this is just a convention that has caught on uh, within the Python community. And so you'll always see import pandas as PD there. And uh, really quick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back up here before we get started. I'm gonna type which Python and make sure that we're in the correct virtual environment. Never hurts to check that inside of the notebook itself. Uh, this little exclamation point here lets us run command line commands or bash commands inside of Jupyter Notebooks, which is why we can run this which command in here. But we are in our virtual environment, so we are good to go. All right, so I want to keep a nice, clean, tidy notebook here. So I'm going to turn a markdown cell into, uh, turn this cell into a markdown cell. I'll put a little two header, a little heading two up here, and I'll say these will be my imports. Maybe I'll make this a header three. All right, I'll turn this into a markdown cell and I'll say load data. So how do we load data in pandas? We've got this nice world happiness data over here sitting in a notebook. And actually if I type LS inside of this Jupyter notebook, you'll see that we have the world happiness data sitting right here ready for us to use. How do we get it into pandas? This leads directly to one of my main tips for Python in general. Um, which is to use the dot notation and then to hit tab. So as soon as we do tab, uh, Jupyter Notebooks is going to help us with some tab autocomplete options here or with, with showing us what we can access within pandas. So I hit pd dot and then I hit tab. And this is everything that pandas 
lets us do. And there's quite a lot of stuff here. You'll notice that there's a mixture of uppercase, like kind of a uppercase uh, title case things here, which are which are classes that we can use. There's some lowercase things here. These are some functions or some some methods that we can use. There's a lot of stuff here, and then some of these are actually even sub modules of pandas. So they are they're things that have additional functions and classes with in them. So there's a lot of stuff here, but for now I will ask you to turn your attention to this function, read CSV. And this leads directly to my second, one of my second favorite Python tips, which is use, to use the question mark notation. And if we do question mark and then we run this cell, this is going to bring up the documentation for what the read CSV function does. So what, is, what does this do? So pd.readCSV. Well, we have a ton of different parameters here that we can pass in to this function. Let's skip down a little bit and just read the, the first couple lines of the doc string here. So read a comma separated values or CSV file into a data frame. Now, a data frame is going to be one of the main objects, probably the main object that we're going to work with in Pandas. And a data frame, you can think about it, really think about a data frame like a sheet inside of Excel or like a table in a database. Or if you're coming from R, you know, just like a data frame. So this function here reads data from a CSV file into a data frame. And the main, the, uh, the main parameter that we need to give it here is a file path or buffer. And now we've got a bunch of other options like how is the file, uh, like what's, what's the delimiter? What's the separator? Um, does your file have columns in it? Does it have a header? Are you going to pass in some columns? Uh, what's the line terminator here? What's the quote character? So a lot of the time you might not need to pass in a lot of these different parameters, but just know that if you've got a funky CSV file, you need to read in data that's got some different formatting going on there. These are all here for you. So let's try to read in one of our data files. So I'm gonna say ls, world happiness and we've got five different data files here let's start with the newest one let's start with 2019.csv and i will call this i'll just call it df df for data frame so you'll see this a lot with pandas df equals pd.readcsv and now i give it a path so i'm going to say world happiness 2019.csv Let's run this and see what happens. Well, it ran just fine. All right, so we, we hypothetically have some data sitting in this data frame right now. Let's, what happens if we just print this thing out? Let's just say, uh, let's just say DF and let's just run this cell and see what happens. All right, look at this. So with a reasonably well formatted data file, we were able to import pandas, read in our data, and look at it all in three little lines of code here, nicely formatted with our column names, which are in our file, and our columns of data here. So you'll see already that we've got, uh, we've got a couple things going on. So our data frame, it's got columns across the top, just kind of like we would expect maybe in a database table or an Excel file or something like that. Um, and then it's got these bold numbers running down the side here over by themselves. Now, this is called the index. And the index is just a way that we can use, if we want, to help look at specific rows and to access specific rows. So this here is the row with index 0. This here is the row with index 1. Etc., and we can even do some cool things if we want. Uh, we could set our index equal to whatever we want it to be. So, if we wanted to index our data 
by country, then we could actually, we could take this column if we wanted and set it as our index, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's, uh, let's keep working through things here. I'm going to create a section. I'm going to call it inspect data. Now, the first thing we're going to do is I'll create a little subsection header here and let's call it, look at the first five rows. Now, this is something that I will do all the time is I'll just do df.head. And df.head just returns the first five rows. And we can, we can return more rows if we want. We can do df.head and pass in 10 here. Look at the first 10 rows. But if you call it without any number in here, it just returns the first five rows so that you can get a sense for your data. So it looks like we have a number field here a rank, we have a country, and then we have these different numeric scores. So df.head helps us look at the first five rows. Now, what if we want to look at the shape of our data? Well, this is where the handy df.shape comes in. And this tells you number of rows, number of columns here. So if we wanted to unpack this, we could say num rows, num calls equals this and maybe say you know print there are num rows rows and num calls calls ta-da all right so we have 156 rows and nine columns and this is a uh, this is also what just what looking at the data up here told us as well 156 rows nine columns but this is a nice way to look at that as well, looking at the shape of our data there. So another thing we might ask is, well, okay, uh, what are our data types of our different columns? You know, we, we, can, we can get a sense for that maybe just by looking at them here. We've got numbers and we've got text and we've got maybe floats and stuff like that. But what are our data types of our columns? So what are the data types of our columns. And this is where the df.d df types attribute comes in handy. So d types is an attribute on the data frame, which means it's something that we can just access and pandas will tell us what type of data is in each column. And you'll notice that this is looking roughly as we would expect here. Our overall rank, well, this is an integer. Our country or region, so object, object is the, the pandas way of basically saying, you know, a string or text or something else, something that's not a number or it's not a Boolean either. It's not true, false. This is an object. And in this case, you know, we can see that this is a country. This is a string. And then the rest of these, well, these are floating floating numbers. These are floats. So we've got decimal points here, 7.769. This is not just a plain, nice integer, um, which is why this data type is different. Now, one thing, one thing that I'll point out really quickly that will be very helpful, helpful for you using pandas in the future is that if you have a column like score, and you expect it to be a float, like let's say we're expecting this to be a float, and it comes back object, well, that might mean that you have some dirty data. I mean, that might mean that you've got some dirty data in there, and pandas wasn't sure if this was a float or not, or a string, and so maybe it read it in as an object type. Maybe it read it in as a, as a string kind of type and you would have to go in there and do some cleaning. Here though, we see that all of these that we would expect to be floats, well, they are floats. So it looks like our data is probably reasonably clean. I'll show you a couple of my other favorite methods here for inspecting the data. So we'll look at describe, describe the data. And here we just do df dot, and I'll hit the DE and hit tab, describe. Now, 
this is a method here, so I can uh, I can run it like this. I could also do the question mark here if you want to look at the documentation for what describe does. And uh, we're not going to pass in any parameters currently, but this says, what does it do? Describe. Generate descriptive statistics. All right. Let's see what happens here. df.describe. We run this, and it outputs... Well, this actually lo just looks like another data frame here, which it is. This is just another Pandas data frame. And it is providing us with some handy-dandy descriptive statistics of all of the columns for which uh, these kind of numeric descriptive statistics are available. So you notice that country or region has disappeared. And that's because you cannot calculate the mean of a country or region, so it leaves it out. So we have our count. You notice that our count here, 156 for each one of these columns. That means that we have 156 rows for each column, so that's looking good. We have our mean. So our mean, let's take a look at our mean score. So we have this column up here, score. We're seeing a lot of sevens in the first five rows, but it looks like our average score is about 5.4. Uh, we can look at our standard deviation. So the score is, you know, 5.4 plus or minus, you know, 1.1. Kind of that's the standard deviation around the mean there. And if we want to look at our min and our max, we see that here. So our score column in particular goes from 2.85 all the way up to 7.76, 7 7.7 or 7.8 there. So we get a good sense of the range of our data. And we can look at this for all of our other columns as well. So healthy life expectancy, let's take a look at this. So our mean is 0.72. Our standard deviation is 0.24. So, you know, 0.72 plus or minus our standard deviation, give or take. Um, our min, well, it looks like it goes all the way down to zero. And our max goes up to 1.14. So you might be thinking to yourself, what the heck does that mean? What does it mean for a healthy life expectancy to go from 0 to 1.14? And that's a great question. And this is when we would go back to our data. And we would look for life expectancy. And we would see that uh, life expectancy... Do, 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 do. Life expectancy, the extent to which life expectancy contributed to the calculation of the happiness score. All right. Well, this is still not very clear, but that's okay. We will go ahead and move on for right now. And one of the last methods that I'll show you here for inspecting the data to begin with is the info. This is the df.info here. And if we run this, you'll see, ah, oh, bound method. What does that mean? Well, this is telling me that this is something that needs to be called. This is a method. And so we call it, and there we go. So we see, OK, what is this? Well, df, that's a data frame. That's good. The index is just a range from 0 to 155 here. Oh, and I'll actually point you really quickly, since we're talking about index. You'll see that the df.describe returns an index that's not just numbers. The index here actually is these labels, count, mean, standard deviation, min, etc., versus the index up here is a range from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So what else does the info method tell us? Well, it tells us that we've got nine columns total, so that's good to know. And then it actually it tells us a couple of the things that we had seen previously as well. So it gives us our column name, 
It gives us our non-null count. This is good to know if we have any nulls in our columns. And here you, you see that we have 156 data points. And for each column, we have 156 non-null. That means that we don't have any nulls in any column. So our data is pretty clean already. And we'll, we'll see some dealing with nulls later. And then you see the, the data type, the D type. So our overall rank, that's an integer. This country or region, that's an object. That's a, a string, you know, text. And then the rest of these are floats. So the info method gives us a nice, uh, a decent amount of information all at once. And then if you want to see, you know, okay, well, how much memory am I using here? We're using 11 kilobytes, uh, very small data set. All right, so before we get into asking some questions of our data, which is really going to be the heart of this tutorial because, you know, project data science, I want you to learn through kind of a question-oriented project-based approach. So we're going to be asking a lot of questions of this data. But before we do that, I want to point out one thing, which is what exactly is a data frame? All right. So we have df here, right? df holds our data. I'm going to use the Python function type to look at the type of our data frame. So our data frame has the type or the class pandas.core.frame.dataframe. Now, this is, like I said, the main or one of the main objects, one of the main classes within pandas. And this is where your data is going to live in this tabular format, just like a database, just like a SQL table, just like an Excel file. Now, a data frame, DF, as we've been talking about, is basically just a series of rows and columns. And specifically, uh, Pandas stores data in terms of columns here. So we can think about this data as being, we can think about this data frame as being the collection of these nine columns. And the way that we access one of these columns is I'm going to use a bracket here. So we're, we're using a bracket notation just like we might with a dictionary. Let's look at country or region. So I, start, I started typing the, the uh, column name here, then I hit tab. And so you can tab complete the name of these columns. Now let's just look at one of these columns. Now you'll notice that this prints out a little bit differently and it gives us a little bit different information. So here's your index over here. So zero, one, two, et cetera. Um, and then here are our values, Finland, Denmark, Norway. And you'll see down here that the name of this column is country or region. The length is 156 and the D type is object because this is a string, you know, this is an object data type here. Now, what is this object that we're now looking at? I'm going to wrap this in type. And you'll see that this is actually a different type of object. And this is the other key object uh, in pandas, pandas.core.series.series. So what you have is you have a data frame, which is of type data frame. And that data frame is made up of columns. And each one of those columns is a series. And to show you that, I'll show you one other of my favorite attributes here, df.columns. That shows you the name of all the columns. And now if we loop through, so we can say for call in columns, Let's print out the type of each one of these columns. Oops, let's type. And you'll see here that for each, and uh, you know, I could maybe make this a little bit more clear using an F string. So I'll print out not only the type, but also the column itself. And we see here that 
the overall rank. This is a series. The GDP per capita. That column is a series. These are all series. So a data frame is your data, tabular kind of format here, like you might expect. And then a data frame is made up of columns, and each column is a pandas series. And this is important because I'll tell you kind of one of the main reasons why it's important. It's important because a data frame is going to have different methods and attributes available to it than a series. So if we use, let's, let's actually take a look here. What methods and attributes are available in a data frame? And then let's also look at what methods and attributes are available in a series. So if we do dir data frame, you'll see here, let's scroll down. These are all of the things that we can call on a data frame. And there's, there's quite a lot. There is quite a lot here, just like, just like pandas. So, um, you know, don't get overwhelmed with all this stuff. I never use half of these, uh, maybe 90% of these, you know, there's only going to be a small subset of these that you actually end up using on a day-to-day -day basis. But if we call dir, uh, you know, let's look at country or region. Well, already up here at the top, whoop, let's see, you can see a couple differences. So we have generosity and score on this data frame here. Um, and these are actually, these are actually columns that are stored as attributes of the data frame versus here, you don't have those because we're now dealing with a separate object. And if we scroll down, to where let's where this starts let's see if we can see some other differences here all right so you can see argmax so argmax is something that is in a pandas series that is not in a pandas data frame and so I'm just bringing all of this up because what's, well, yeah, what's the, what's the main reason? The main reason I'm bringing this up is that sometimes you might find yourself calling something. Like let's say you're trying to do, you know, df, df.argmax or whatever, and you think that it should be working and it's not working because data frame object has no attribute argmax. Well, people get themselves into the situation quite a lot, and it's usually because they're using an attribute or a method that can only be called on a column, it can only be called on a series, and you're trying to call it on the data frame or vice versa. You know, you're calling something on the series that can only be called on the data frame. And if, if this doesn't make a ton of sense right now, don't worry. I guarantee that you will run into the situation where you find yourself getting an error that says, you know, ah, I can't, I, this thing isn't working. Why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? Well, you know, one of the options is that you're calling it on a data frame when you should be calling it on a series, or you're calling it on a series when you should be calling it on a data frame. So to recap, so let's see, to recap this discussion, we will say data frame equals collection equals uh equals the full data a collection of columns and we will say series equals a single column a data frame is a collection of series all right all right, so let's go ahead and move on to asking and answering some questions. So I'll create a new section header here. I'll call it section number one, working with one data set. And let's say question number one, what is the average min and max 
uh, happiness score. Now, this is something that we already know because of our describe function up here, but this will be a good opportunity for you to see some of the uh, some of the arithmetic that you can do with um, with our columns here. So if we do df, let's look at our score column. So let's look at our score column there. And if we do dot mean, let's do dot mean. So this is the average score there. Now let's let's take a look at dot min. And let's take a look at dot max. There we go. So you can see here that if you have a column, you can call these operations on it, dot mean, dot min, dot max. There are all kinds of these things that you can call on a column to get some descriptive statistics here. Now, you might also be wondering, can we call these on the full data frame? And this is one of the instances where, yes, you can. So if we call df.min, let's see what that returns. And we get the minimum value for each column. And notice that it actually does it for the object data type as well. And it does it alphabetically. So the minimum value here is Afghanistan because that comes first in the alphabet. All right, perfect. Let's move on to our next question. Well, we might wonder, okay, uh, so question number two, you say, well, you might ask, well, what's the score for my country, uh, for, for where I live? So I live in the United States. I'm going to say, what is the score for the United States? And this is where we get into some of the heart of using pandas, and that is filtering down our data. So you notice here that we can't see the United States in this country or region. It must be in the middle of the list here as far as score goes. Um, so how do we access that data? And here, you know, we, we have a small enough data set. I could just go look for it if I want. But with bigger data, you're definitely going to want to be able to search. So how do we do that? Well, the first way, let's maybe, uh, let's maybe create a... A markdown cell here and we'll say you know option number one is we can use uh, we can use the bracket notation filtering so what do I mean by that well I mean let's take a look at our country or region country or region so this is our this is a series a panda series with the name of all our countries now I want this to equal the United States. So this is kind of similar, uh, you know, this is very normal Python notation here, using the double equal sign to say, to assess where these things are equal or if it's equal. And in this case, you'll notice that what we get here is all of these Booleans. And now we're just seeing falses because, because if we go back to our if we go back to our data here, you know, Finland is not equal to the United States. Denmark is not equal to the United States. So we set it equal to the United States, and this creates a Boolean mask. And we will we'll say we'll say here create a Boolean mask. And I'll even call this I'll call this a uh, United States Boolean mask here. All right, and if we look at that, it's this panda series of trues and falses. Now we can filter our data down by passing in this Boolean mask to our data frame. So now if we do DF bracket and then pass in our United States Boolean mask, well, look at this. It returned just the row with the United States data. And we can see this is what index of 18 here. So if I do, um, if I do df.head20, we will be able to see that the United States is down here at row index 18, 
which is exactly the row that we returned. So this is the first way we can do that. And now that we have our data filtered down to this, well, let me check the data type of this row. This is a data frame because even though, even though we only have one row here, we have multiple columns. And so each one of these columns is still a pandas series. So we're still dealing with the data frame here. And now if we want to access the score, well, we could use our notation to access this column like we have been doing there. And here is our score. Um, now, to actually get this score, we're like, well, well what, is, what is this? This is, uh, this is, this is a pandas core series. So this is a series still. So what if we just want the number? You know, we, we want to just extract this number. We want to use it somewhere else. How do we do that? Well, one way we can do it is we can, let, let's try just accessing this like we might normally with a Python list with this, this zero here. Well, it's, this is going to throw a key error and say, ah, there's no, there's no key zero here. So um, this is where we have a couple of options. We can convert this value to a NumPy array using dot values. And this is something that will come up quite a bit is using dot values to access the data as a NumPy array. We can also do this with the full data frame, df dot values. And here we get out a NumPy array. And so a NumPy array is basically, it's, it's a lot more similar to just a normal Python list. We can access this with the zero notation to get our, our first list here. And let's get our first item of our first list, and that's a one. So we could we could pass this out as a NumPy array, and then we could use the the uh, bracket access notation here to get that value out. All right, or we can use this dot iloc method. And iloc, well, what does this mean? This means index locator. So index locator, we we access this attribute here, and then we use the same square bracket notation, and we say, give me the zeroth item in this thing, and there is our value. So we can use dot iloc to get that as well. And we're gonna be we're gonna be going into this more in just one second here. So before we do that, let's look at this method all in one line. So we say first, okay, I have my country or region. I want this to equal the United States. I want to subset my data to just this. So I'm going to wrap this whole thing in square brackets here. So I'm subsetting my data to just where the country or region equals the United States. Now I just want to look at the score. And I can do dot values zero or I can do dot iloc zero. All right. Now we're going to be diving into this dot iloc operator and dot loc. There's another one called dot loc here in just a second. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So this is going to be option number two. Use indexes or indices with dot iloc and dot loc. So dot iloc and dot loc, uh, these can definitely be confusing to wrap your head around. So let's spend a moment here looking at what they do. So dot iloc is going to reference rows and columns by their, um, by their position sort of by their by their numeric index in the list. So just like if we have a, you know, if we say, you know, normal Python list, or if we have, let's have just L equals A, B, C, D, right? 
Now, if we do L0, that returns A. If we do L1, that returns B, etc. This is how dot iloc works, is it works using this numeric index here, indexing into the data. So if we do dot iloc 0, what does this return? Well, it returns our first row of data. So notice that this is not a column now. And let's look. And if we look at the data type of what it's returning, you'll notice that this is a series, but it's not an original column from our data. This is returning a new object, which is the first row of our data here. So if I do dot head, oops, dot head and call that, you'll see that this is our first row of data. Overall rank is one, country or region is Finland, the score is 7.769. So dot iloc zero returns the zeroth row or the first row. Now we can also pass in a number for the column index we wanna return. So let's say we just wanna to, want to return Finland so in this case, we would say, OK, well, I want, I want the first row. So I want dot iloc 0, so row. Now what column index do I want? Well, I want country or region, but what's the, what's the index number of that? So 0, 1. So we pass in 0, 1 here. And there we go, Finland. So, so, we, could say, so we could say iloc is a way to access data in a data frame by the numeric position of the rows and columns. So this is not looking at the name of the column, and it's not looking at the name of the index either. Although in this case, and this is kind of confusing, in this case, the name of the index is the number that we would use anyways because this is a range index and that's how that matches up but we'll see in just a second here that our index you know can be it can be strings or it could be numbers in different orders so iloc is a way to access data in a data frame by the numeric position of the rows and columns so let's try something else here let's say that i want to access the score for Iceland. Let's try to do that. So I'm going to do df.iloc. Now what row do I want to access? I want to access the 0, 1, 2, 3rd row. So I'll say 3. And I want the 0, 1, 2. I want the second uh, column index here. And if we get this right, this should be 7.494. There we go. All right, so remember that iloc is a way to access data in a data frame by the numeric position of the rows and columns. Now, going back to our question, what was our question? What's the score for the United States? Well, this doesn't necessarily help us solve that because we would need to know we would need to know the numeric position of where the United States is. And this is where setting a different index can really come in handy. Let's try this out. So I'm going to say df, and let's say df country index equals, I'm going to say df.set index. So we're going to create a new data frame here. Actually, before I set this equal to anything, let me just show you this. I'm going to set the index as country or region. And this is not changing our original data frame. This is returning a new object. There is an option, if we wanted to change it, we could set in place equals true. And this would alter this, would alter this object here. But uh, I, want to, I want to assign this to a new object. So I'm going to not say that because then that keeps our original data nice and clean 
and we're not tinkering with it. So this is what it does. <clears throat> Rather than having our index up here be this range, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we have just set our index to the country or region. So you'll notice that country or region is now gone from our columns, and the index is now country or region. So I'm going to say df country index equals this. Now let's take a look. So now let's ask the same question that we asked before about Iceland. What is the score of Iceland? So let's use the same dot iloc operator to show that it still works even though our, our index is no longer numbers. Our index is now strings. So we want to go down 0, 1, 2, 3. And now our score, we want to go over 1, two, or, uh, sorry, 0, 1, 0, 1. And that gives us what we expect, 7.494, which is the score for Iceland. But now, but now that we have our index being this country or region string, now we can use this cool thing called dot loc. And now dot iloc, if this references by, by kind of a numeric index or numeric position, dot loc references by the name. So let's try this now. Rather than the numeric position of our row and column, let's try referencing Iceland by the name. So now our index for Iceland, well, this is just going to be Iceland. And what's the name of the column that we want? Well, the name of the column that we want is score. Now, if I run this, 7.494, the exact same thing that we were getting before. So, dot loc, and I'll put up here dot iloc, dot loc is a way to access data in a data frame by the name of the index and the name of the column. So if I wanted the entire row, let's say I want the entire row for Iceland. Well, I could just do dot loc Iceland. And this will return me that whole row there. And you'll see name Iceland. So this is kind of the name of the index at that point. So going back to our original question, what is the score for the United States? Well, now I can access it very easily using this dot loc notation, dot loc United States as the, as the row that I want, as the index that I want, and score as the column, boom. And does this match what we got previously? 6.892, 6.892, there we go. So using the dot loc notation to get the happiness score for the United States. There we go. So now you'll see that we have a few different options for whenever we want to search and filter our data frame. We can use this bracket notation here. So we can say, hey, you know, give me all of the data where the country or region equals United States. And uh, we can also say, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna set my index equal to something and I'm just gonna index by the thing that I wanna find and by the column. So we have a couple different ways that we can do this here. And notice that this way, this method though, does rely on your index being set to something that you can index into like this, something that you can search like this. All right, let's move on to our next question. So our next question here is what question number are we on? Question number three. What is the happiest country? All right. So in this case, let's go back to our original data frame. 
in this case, it looks like our data is actually already sorted by our happiness score. Um, so I think that we can probably get the answer immediately, which is Finland. So let's change this actually. Let's say, what is the country with the highest maybe generosity score? So our data is definitely not sorted by this generosity score. So let's look at that. All right, how do we sort a data frame? Well, if we type dot, and then maybe we have a question like, oh, does this have a sort method? So I'll type, I'll start typing sort, S-O, I'll hit tab, and you'll see that two methods come up that we have access to. We have access to a sort index, and we have access to a sort values. Now in this case, our index is already sorted, and uh, we, d we don't actually care about having a sorted index right now because the question we're trying to answer is what country has the highest generosity score? So we want to search, or we want to sort values. I'll, to, I'll do my little question mark trick to look at the documentation. And you'll see that everything has a default except for by. So we need to pass in something here for by. So sort the values along either axis. So either axis, we can actually sort uh, along the row here, or we can sort along the column. But we want to sort by the column. So what is by? By is a string or a list of strings. So this is the name or the list of names to sort by. So let us do that. Sort values by equals generosity. And what happens? Well, if we look at our generosity column, we see that we start at zero and we go up to 0.566. So this is pretty interesting. Uh, it's sorted ascending, so it started low and then it ends up high. Now, what if we want what if we want to sort descending? Well, let's actually go back to our sort values documentation and let's take a look at the parameters and you'll see this one right here: ascending equals true. So we're going to say ascending equals false. And we sort that. And here we go. We see that Myanmar, Myanmar right there, is the country with the highest generosity score. So now we know. And if we wanted to get just this row of data, well, we could do head. Uh, and specifically, we could do head one, so we could just get one row of data. Or we could do iloc zero. You know, we could say, give me the first row, dot iloc zero there. And this is all returning the same thing. And um, maybe actually what we want to do is we could say dot loc. Let's pass in this index, 130. And let's pass in country or region. And that gives us Myanmar. Or we could do dot iloc and say, give me the first row and give me the second column there. And this is all giving us the same thing. So all kind of ways to look at our data there. We just answered the question, and we answered it by sorting our values. And uh, that's a good way to go about that. Now, one other quick way that we might do this, and I'll say, you know, approach, approach number two, um, argmax. And if, uh, if your brain is already starting to feel a little full, by the way, then just tune out this next bit here. But if you're wanting more, then here's another little trick for you. So we can take a look at the column generosity, and we can call dot arg max on that. And arg max is going to return the index where this column is a maximum. And so this is saying, hey, this column is a maximum at index 130. And now what we can do, so we can say this is max 
generosity IDX, so max generosity index. And we can say df dot i loc max generosity index. There we go. And so this is returning that same row of data. So we say what index is the generosity a maximum at, and then we index into our data at that index. And if we wanted to look at just the country or region, well, then we could uh, we could either access that using our bracket notation. Oop, not that country, country or region. Or we could do the I loc, give me that second column there. And these are all kind of going to give us the same thing. All right. So uh, hopefully, if your brain is feeling a little full from all of this new pandas knowledge, that you're able to tune that out. But let's move on. Question number four. What is the distribution of happiness, or what does the uh, what does the distribution of happiness scores look like? All right, so let's take a look at our data frame again. DF score. So we want to know what this distribution looks like. And pandas gives us very nice helper functions here. Um, I'm going to set this equal to my score column. Let's take a look at score column. So our type of score column is going to be a pandas series, remember, because this is a column. Now, if I type dot and then I hit tab, this is going to show me all of the different attributes and methods that I can call on this. And if we scroll down, hist, you'll see this little hist right here. What is hist? Well, hist draws a histogram of the input series using matplotlib, which is the popular Python plotting library. So all we have to do is call this method, and there we go. Look at that. This is the distribution of the different happiness scores. We have some attributes here that we can pass in, like the number of bins. Let's say we want to pass in 30 bins. Now we've got a little bit more of a granular histogram here. If we only want five bins, you know, we can have something that looks more like a bell curve there. But if we don't pass anything in, then here is our distribution. So we see that most countries lie here right in the middle, somewhere between, what is this, like 4.2 all the way up to kind of 6.2, something like that. And then we've got some outliers here. Not outliers, but um, we have the countries with the higher happiness scores up here above that score of 7. So plotting a histogram in, Py in, uh, in pandas is that easy. And we can go ahead and, uh, and move on. So my next question here leads directly from that last question, question number five. And this is, you know, maybe cheating a little bit. What does the distribution of all of our columns look like? So what if we want a histogram for all of these? Well, this is one of those situations where we can actually just call df.hist on the full thing. And you'll see uh, you'll see kind of this ugly output here and you might be like, "Oh, what is that?" Well, whenever you see this out in a Jupyter notebook, this is indicating that we're returning something here which we're not capturing in a variable. So, you know, just like you can do 1 plus 1 and print that out, that equals 2, or you could say x equals 1 plus 1, and now this 1 plus 1 which equals two is getting stored in a variable called x, and it's not getting returned to the out, uh, kind of the printing out there. So that's what's happening here. df.hist is returning this numpy array of a bunch of matplotlib axes representing all these graphs here. We're not capturing it in a variable, and so it's printing it to out. So all we have to do to make this go away is assign it to some throwaway variable 
the typical throwaway variable here in Python is an underscore. And now if we do that, then we don't get that printout. Now you might be saying, hey, this is pretty cool. We get all of our histograms here, but they are looking awfully small. So if I do df.hist and I look at the documentation again, you'll see down here this little thing called fig size. Fig size, not the size of the fruit fig, but the size of the figure that we're plotting things on. Um, so all we have to do is pass in a fig size parameter. And I'm going to set this equal to 10 comma 10. So that's kind of a height and width thing there. And there we go. We got some bigger histograms here. So freedom to make life choices. There's a histogram for that column. GDP per capita. Here's a histogram for that column. Uh, so we can see histograms for all of our data. And you see some pretty interesting things here, like that social support and freedom to make life choices. These columns have data that kind of keep increasing. Perceptions of corruption looks like the concentration of uh, most of our country's data for this column is down here, right around you know, 0, 0 0.1, something like that. So this is a nice quick way to get a sense of the distribution of all of our numeric data. And once again, you'll notice that country is not listed here because country can't be plotted in a histogram. It's not numeric data. All right, let's move on. Okay, so question six, question six here. What if we are interested in uh, what is the relationship between social support and happiness score? So here we're, we're interested in plotting not a distribution of these values for a single column. We're interested in plotting the relationship between two of these values. So do, are, are they positively correlated? Or are they negatively correlated? Is there no correlation? All, all that kind of stuff. So we can do that with, uh, up, up here, you know, we did this df.hist method. Um, well, there's a more generic plotting method called df.plot. So let's do the question mark here. Look at our documentation. So df.plot accepts, you'll see here, the signature uh, just has some general arguments and keyword arguments here. Um, and the parameters that it says it accepts here, data, x, y, you can specify the, the kind of graph here. And then you can do other things like, you know, your figure size, a title for the graph. So let's go ahead. And uh, for data, we don't need to pass anything in here because we are calling this on df. So we know that we're plotting from our data frame. We will pass in our x. Now we want to look at the relationship between social support and happiness. So maybe x can be social support. Uh, whoops, hit run too early. Let's do y equals score here. And uh, you know what, let's, let's give it a title. We'll say title equals relationship between social support and happiness. There we go. So if we run this, then you'll see we get this kind of crazy squiggly line here. Um, and that's because if we go back to our documentation, df.plot, you'll see that kind, well, the kind of plot that it produces is a line plot by default. So what we want actually is down here. This is a scatter plot. So let's pass in maybe here in the middle, kind equals scatter. And now let's try this again. And there we go. Using our pandas data frame and the generic plot function, we pass in the name of the column that we want along the x-axis, the name of the column that we want along the y-axis. We say what kind of graph we want, and then we can pass in some other parameters like title, etc. And we get a nice scatter plot of social support 
versus happiness score. And as you'll see here, this looks like a pretty strong positive correlation between social support and happiness. Um, especially as you get up here towards the top. But yeah, you can see that very nice positive correlation there. All right, moving on. Question number seven. Question number seven. So let's talk a little bit more about how we might manipulate some of these columns. So we currently have a score that ranges from, you know, two point something to seven point something. And uh, this is on a scale. If we go back over here to our data, the average life, let's see, occasionally exceeding one point. So our scale is from zero to 10 here. Um, so the worst that you could have is a zero. The best that you can have is a 10. What if we wanted to plot this from, let's say, zero to 100? So this is a very simple uh, transformation that we want to do. We just want to multiply all of these scores by 10. But let's take a look at how we would do that. What if we wanted to? Um, what if we wanted to have the score go from zero to 100 rather than zero to 10? So if we look at DF score. Well, let's just look at our data frame again, first of all. So we have our overall rank, we got our country score. So let's take a look at our score. And this is sorted here. So this is our maximum value. This is our minimum value. So getting this to go on a scale from 0 to 100 rather than 0 to 10. Well, if, if we don't need to do any other transformation of these values other than multiply by 10, this is very easy. We just take this column and we multiply it by 10. And there you go. Now we have our score out of 100 rather than from 0 to 10. Now what if we wanted to set this equal? What if we wanted to what if we wanted to add this back into our data? So maybe we have score, maybe we also want to have score out of 100. So I am going to uh, because I don't want to make I don't want to make these changes on our original data frame. I'm going to make a copy of our data frame using this df.copy here. And this is going to make an identical duplicate of this data frame object and store it in df.copy. And then if we make changes to df.copy, we are not going to be making changes to our original data frame. So this preserves the quality of our original data here. So now, just to show you that that's the case, df copy. This is an identical copy of our original um, data frame. Maybe I'll create a new column called score uh, out of 100. And all I have to do is set this equal to df copy score times 100. Now, if we look at df copy again, oh, sorry, not times 100, times 10. There we go, just redo that. So here is our score out of 100 now. So now you see that Finland has a score of a 77.69 and South Sudan has a score of 28.53. So that's how easy it is to do um, arithmetic with columns and then store them back as new columns that then you can use in your data. Now we're going to move on to section two, and we're really getting into the weeds of things now. Section number two, concatenating multiple data sets. So you remember how uh, we have multiple CSV files here. So we have 2015, 2016, etc. but we're currently only using 2019. So the question is, how do we get some of these other data sets? We don't necessarily have to get all of them into our data frame right now for this tutorial, but how do we bring in some of these other ones? So that's the first question that we are going to tackle. So I will create a little section header here. Question number, what question number are we at? Eight. Uh, I have... 
I have, uh, let's see, multiple data sets that I want to combine. How can I bring them all together? All right, so we're going to break this down into a few different pieces here. So maybe we'll say step number one, load all of the data. So there are lots of different ways that you could do this, but I'll show you one way to do it right now. So to start off with, let's look at our files again. So we have this directory here, world happiness, and we have five different CSV files. So I'm going to use the handy dandy glob Python library, and this is a standard Python library that comes with your Python installation. And what you can do is if you say glob.glob, .glob, very, uh, very sexy names here, glob.glob, .glob, and then you pass it the directory, and then you just say star, you just say, hey, give me all of the things in this directory, then this actually returns a list of all of the files in this directory. And if we wanted, you know, we could do like star.csv to say, give me all the CSV files. But in this case, since all of the data in this directory uh, all we have are CSV files, we can just say like star as well. So I'm going to set this equal to file names. So we have a list of file names now. And maybe what I want to do is I want to establish, I want to instantiate a dictionary called DFs for data frames. And what I'm going to do is for each file for f in file names, I want to load in some data. I want to say data equals pd.readcsvf. So what we're doing here is we're looping through the file names and we're reading in a separate data frame for each file. Now what I want to do is I want to store, um, I want to store each data frame in, I, I really want the year here. So I want, you know, like 2015, 2016, etc. So how do I get the year out of these file names? Well, let's take a look here. File names. Let's just look at file names zero. So we're going to have a file name like this. Um, you know, you can do this a bunch of different ways as well. But for the purpose of right now, I believe I can go back. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go back like eight characters. And then, so I go from the negative eighth index to the negative fourth index of this string. And that gives me the year. Um, you could also go about, you know, splitting this. Up, you could split it on uh, the forward slash, and then take the last index there, and then you know you could split that on a period, and then you could take the first index there, and this gives you the the year as well. So you got a few different ways that you could do this depending on how clean your file names are and what these patterns are. But I'll just use this right now. So we'll say year equals, and we're going to replace file names zero with f, because f is our file name that we're looping through. And then we say, okay, we want the key to be the year, and we want the value to be the data frame. So let's do that. And it reads everything in just fine. And now if you look at dfs.keys, you'll see that we have one key for all of our years. So that is a pretty cool. Now, if I were to look at DFs 2019, so I, I look at the key 2019. This is our data frame that we've been working with. This is the data that you're used to. You know, we have the 7.494 for Iceland that we got very used to earlier. Um, but let's take a look at the data for 2015. So let's jump back four years. And now you see that this actually looks a little different. We have country instead of country or region. We actually, we do have a region column now, which looks like it categorizes countries into various regions. 
Um, these column names are all a little different. Happiness rank, happiness score. We have some additional columns here, like standard error is a new one. Uh, dystopia residual, which is a pretty epic sounding thing. That's, that's new. Um, so these data frames are not identical, which is going to make combining them maybe a little bit of a challenge. But let's, uh, let's take a look really quick at some high level descriptor statistics or some high level attributes of these data frames. So step one, load all the data. We'll say step number two, look at the shape of each year's data frame. So here what we can do is we can loop through, we can say for year data in dfs.items. So dfs.items, this is how you can take a dictionary and unpack it into a key and a value. So we might say for k, you know, for key value, for key value in dfs.items. Um, but since we know that the key is the year and the value is the data frame, I'm going to use year and data. And by the way, I'm not using df here because that would overwrite that would overwrite our df variable up here that we've been using so far. So that's why I'm not using that. So for year data in dfs.items, let's print let's print the year and then let's print data.shape so we're going to look at the shape of each one of these data frames. And if we do that, you'll see, and it, you know, it looks like these, these keys are a little bit out of order here. So maybe what I'll do is I'll say, um, I'll say years equals dfs.keys. And uh, let's sort that. So, and then maybe what we can do is we can say for year in years, uh, we can say data equals df's year. And then we are back to where we were. So let's get these in order here. There we go. So you see that 2015 has 158 rows, 12 columns. 2016, 157 rows, 13 columns. So we added a column there. So these two data frames are definitely going to have different columns because of that one at least. And there might be some additional name changes in there as well, column name changes. We go back down to 12. And then 2019 and 2018 both have the same number of columns. So let's start with 2019 and 2018. Since 2019 is the data we've been working with, and 2018 is one year before, and these have the same number of columns, let's see if we can combine these uh, two data frames into one single data frame. To do that, I'm going to say step number three here. I'm going to say add a year column to each, to each data frame. And why are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this because uh, if, if we look at each one of these data frames, you know, we have the country, we have all these rankings, but there's nothing in here about the year, which means if we start combining data, we're suddenly going to have two rows for Switzerland, and we're not going to know which row was from 2019 and which was from 2018. So let's take a look at all these data frames first and just make sure that we don't have a year. So we maybe say, you know, for, um, for year and years, data equals DF's year. And we can say, you know, maybe print data dot head. Maybe we'll just print the first the print the first row, and we'll print the uh, we'll print the year as well. Also, this comes out looking pretty ugly because we are looking at multiples. You know, whenever you print a data frame, it's going to look a little different than if you don't use the print command. If you just kind of let Jupyter Notebooks handle the output there. Um, but 2015, do we have a year? Doesn't look like we do. 2016, is there a column for the year? Doesn't look like it. 2017, column for the year? Nope. And then 2018, 2019. So there's no column for year. 
So what we're going to do now is for year and years, we're going to take this data frame, DF's year, so this is going to access the data frame. We're going to add a column called year, and then we're going to set this equal to year. And now, just to show you what this, this would look like, let's take our DF copy again. This is one that we can just kind of experiment with. So DF copy, what if we say year equals 2019? So just like before, we're creating a new column. We name it here. We say equals, just kind of like you do in Python. And then you can just set this equals to something. And this will set the entire column equal to this value. So we do that. Let's look at dfcopy.head. And there is our column for year in our DF copy. So that's what we're going to do for each one of these data frames. So for year and years, we're going to access the data. We're going to create a new column called year, and we're going to set it equal to just the year. So let's go ahead and loop through and do that. And now if we take a look at, let's take a look at 2015. Let's take a look at this data frame dot head. There we go. Year 2015. Let's take a look at 2016. Looks like the year is correct. And let's take a look at 2019. There we go. So we just created a column in all of our data frames with the year. So now whenever we start combining this data, we're going to retain that year information. So we're going to know which data comes from which file. All right, now step number four here. So step number four, combine data for years 2019 and 2018. Now, we didn't actually verify yet that these two files have the same columns. So let's do that. Let's look at DF's 2019. And remember, this is the data we've been working with. We just read it in. We read it in via pandas a second time into this dictionary here. Uh, so this is going to be the same data frame as the DF one, except for now we've added a year column to this DF's 2019 one. And remember that type DF's, well, this is just a dictionary. This is just an object that helps us store this information so that we don't have to do something like this, DF 2019, DF 2018, DF 2017, DF 2016, DF 2015, and have each one of these equal to pd.readcsv, you know, whatever, and pd.readcsv, whatever. So this would get old real fast, and by using a dictionary, we're able to more efficiently hold all of this information in a nice structured way. So that is why we're doing that, by the way. All right, closing that back out. So we have our 2019. Let's take a look at the columns. Let's take a look at the columns in this data frame. And let's take a look at the columns in 2018. So we suspect that these are the same, and just glancing at them, it looks like they're, they're the same, but how can we check to see if they are the same programmatically? So programmatically, you know, just meaning we, we want a way to do this without just using our eyeballs to scan over, you know, however many columns this is. What if we had, what if we had 200 columns? We certainly want to, wouldn't want to check that with just our eyes. So this is where we can use sets and sets are a beautiful Python object and you know just a mathematical object as well. A set is basically a collection of items and it's a collection of distinct items. So if you have a set of, we're, let's say we're gonna turn a list into a set here. Let's say you have a set of one, two, three, and then you've got a set one, two, three, but if you've got a set of one, 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 two, three, well, that's still just one, two, three. So you basically remove all of the duplicates. And sets have some really nice operations that you can do on them. For example, uh, I could do set, you know, let's take a look at the set of uh, four, five, six. And maybe we also have the set of, uh, let's see, two, three, four. 
and we want to see which items are in the first set that are not in the second set, well, we can use this little subtract operator. And the subtract operator, whenever you work with sets, says, hey, give me all the things that are in set 1, set A, that are not in set B. And uh, likewise, there's this handy dandy caret operator. So it's that little thing that looks like an upside down V up for me on the, uh, the, the number six there. And this is called the symmetric difference operator. And basically what it does is it gives you everything that's in either this set or this set, but not both of them. So it gives you all the unique items and in this case, you know, maybe it's a little bit easier to see if we flip it around this way. This is going to give us the same result. So this symmetric difference prints out 2, 3, 5, 6. And you notice that these are all of the elements from these two sets that only appear in one of the sets. So since this 4 here appears in both sets, we exclude it. So 2 and 3 only appear over here, 5 and 6 only appear over here, and so we return those. Now, you might be saying, hey, what does all of this have to do with what we're doing with our columns? Well, what it has to do is that we can very easily check to see if these column lists are exactly the same because we can... Or, or we can see which columns are different by using this caret operator. So if this returns anything, then that means those columns only appear in one of the data frames, and thus the column sets are not equal. So we run this, and we see that we have an empty set, which means that these column sets for these are the same. They are identical. And in this case, we could also we could also uh, just use the double equals operator here to check to see if these two sets are the same. But where this might come in handy later, since we're already on this, is let's say I wanted to check the difference between the 2019 data frame and the 2015 one, since we know that there definitely are some differences here. Now we run this and whoa, suddenly there are a bunch of columns that only appear in one or the other. So for example, you can see here that country appears in one of them. And I know that that's the, uh, that's the 2015 data set. Country or region only appears in DF 2019. Region down here only appears in 2015. And then you'll notice that some of these are pretty close, but they're not the same, which means that the names are just different. So health life expectancy is different from healthy life expectancy. So we have different columns. Those aren't going to match up exactly. But for right now, what we care about is the fact that 2019 and 2018 do have exactly the same columns. So as far as combining data for these years, this is where we're going to use this handy-dandy pandas uh, function called concat. Concat for concatenate. So here's the doc string. You pass in a list of objects. So this is going to be a list, in our case, of pandas data frames. And then it's going to concatenate pandas objects along a particular axis. And uh, here, by the way, axis 0 equals index, 1 equals columns. The default is 0. This can be a little bit confusing. So this is definitely worth playing around with a little bit. But basically, the default is going to work fine in our case that is going to add the rows vertically. It's going to stack them. It's not going to put them side by side. And you'll see what that means in just a second. So what do we want to concatenate? 
Well, we want our list of objects here. And what do we want to do? Well, we want DFs, we want to combine the 2019 data and the 2018 data. Now I run this, and what do we have? Well, suddenly we have 312 rows, and you'll see over here for our year that these top rows all have 2019, and these bottom rows all have 2018. How sweet is that? We just took two data sets uh, that had the same columns, and with this one simple little concat function here, we were able to stack them on top of each other. So if you have, let's say, a bunch of CSV files or a bunch of Excel files or whatever, and they all have the same columns and you want to combine them over time like this, then pd.concat is going to be your friend. You could loop through an entire directory with a million different files and combine them all into one. And wouldn't that be such a beautiful thing? All right. Now, one thing that you might notice here is that it looks like our index is still only counting up to 155. And now why would that be? And actually, let's let's say let's call this df concat for a concatenated data frame here. df concat and using our handy dandy dot uh, dot loc operator, let's locate the in the uh, the rows with index zero. And you might be thinking, hey, there should only be one row with index zero, right? And you would be right, but here we go. Two rows with index zero. One for 2019 and one for 2018. And that's because in our original data, the indices go from zero through, you know, like 150 for each one of these data sets. And whenever we combine them with the concat function, it just stacks those indices on top of each other. So this is probably not the functionality that we want. And if we look back at the pd.concat documentation, we'll notice that there is a handy dandy little parameter here called ignore index, which is default set to false. But if we look at this, if true, do not use the index values along the concatenation axis. The resulting axis will be labeled 0 through n minus 1. This is useful if you're concatenating objects where the concatenation axis does not have meaningful indexing information. So currently, our index does not have meaningful indexing information. It's just 0 through 150 or whatever. So we can pass in ignore index equals true. Let's run this. Let's look at df concat again. And now you'll see that our index goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way up to 311. And uh, if we do the dot loc 0, then you'll see we only have one row, which gets returned as a pandas series, since there's just one row here. So now we have successfully created a single data frame that has data for 2019 and 2018 in it, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but we might be asking ourselves, all right, well, how do we get some of this other data in here? So let's take a look at that because data cleaning and data manipulation and data engineering are large parts of data science. You know, you've probably heard that again and again, and it's definitely true. So dealing with dirty data is going to be a huge part of your job. And um, let's deal with some dirty data. Or it's not even dirty necessarily. It's just, you know, we have to structure it in the right way to do the analysis that we want to do. So step number five, combine data for years. Um, you know, let's just start for right now with 2019, 2018, and then let's jump back to 2015 so that we have some of that older historical data in there. So just like before, let's take a quick peek at how many columns we're going to need to work on cleaning up here. All right, 
So we see that we have all of these columns which differ between the two data sets. And there are a few different ways that we could go about this. But since we've already combined the 2019 and the 2018 data, and since the 2019 data is the newest, maybe we want to make the choice to stick with the 2019 column names. And if we need to make any changes, we'll make them to the 2015 data. So let's take a look at our 2019 data. I'll say dot head, maybe just dot head one for right now. And let's look at the 2015 data dot head one. So let's figure out how to make the columns from 2015 match up with 2019 so that we can combine these. And you might be asking yourself, by the way, you know, like, hey, what happens if we just don't try to match them up? What happens then? Um, and by the way, this is one of the cool things about coding and about data science is if you ever have a question like that, you can just try it. So unless you're dealing with, you know, the production database of a bank or a hospital, like you don't really have to worry about breaking too much here. You can just, just try it out, just see what happens. So let's try to concatenate the data from 2019 and the data from 2015. Let's see what happens. And this is what happens. So you'll see here we have 314 rows. We have 21 columns. So uh, the 2015 data set, let's see, how many, how many does that have? 2015 only has 13 columns. We know that our 2019 data only has like nine or 10 columns and we end up with 21. And you're gonna see a bunch of NANs floating around here. So NAN stands for like not a number. It's basically the same thing as a null um, saying, hey, there's no value here. And you'll notice that for all of the 2019 columns, uh, like overall rank, score, all of the 2015 data has NANs. The only exception here is generosity, which apparently matched up. And then for all of the 2015 columns where these have data, like happiness rank and dystopia residual, all of the 2015 uh, data, all the 2015 rows have data, and all the 2019 ones are NANs. So whenever the columns don't match up, you can still concatenate. You know, we still added all the rows together here. But what happens is that all of the new columns end up getting brought in as totally new columns, and they don't get matched up in the way that we would want them to. Uh, you know, health life expectancy just got turned into a new column. It did not get matched up to healthy life expectancy. So we need to go do that matching up ourselves. All right. So to change column names, to match these up where we can, Let's take a look at our DF copy again, you know, our handy dandy experimental data frame. And let's say that we wanted to change some of the column names here. Well, uh, we have, how many columns do we have? We have 11 columns here. So what if we want to change the name of some of these? Well, what we can do is just as easy as saying, you know, dfcopy.columns equals uh, some list. So we can just specify, you know, the new like column one, column two, et cetera. Now, the thing is here that we need, we need to specify a column name for each one of these columns, even if we don't want to change it. So maybe what we could do is we could say, you know, old columns equals dfcopy.columns. Let's take a look at old columns here. Now, if we want to change this first column name to from overall rank to, uh, you know, let's capitalize. Well, you know, let's just let's just call it like um, rank. You know, all caps. Then you're going to get this type error, which is that index does not support mutable operations, and that's just because of the type of object that this index thing is. So to get around that, what we can do is we can convert this to a list. We can just cast it to a list here. 
now our old columns object is just a list. And if we want to set the first item to rank, then our column names just got changed. And now what we can do is this is just a list of column names. We can say df copy dot columns equals uh, old columns. And actually, you know what? Maybe we want to say, maybe we want to say, uh, let's say new columns equals old columns here. And then we'll change the value for new columns. So if you look at our old columns, oh, these might be the same object. Let's take a look at this. So old columns, new columns. So this is a handy way in Python to check and see if you're dealing with the same object. And here we are because I did not put the dot copy here at the end of the list. So um, basically what just happened is created a list called old columns. We assigned new columns to old columns. And rather than creating a new object, this just, this just referenced the old object essentially. So whenever we made a change to the, to the new columns variable, this actually also changed the old columns. So this is why dot copy is important. This can definitely trip you up. If you start doing stuff like this, like assigning new variables to old variables. So, all right, so we do this, copy, new columns, zero equals rank. Now, if we look at these IDs, they should be different and they are, which means that Python is pointing to two different objects in memory. Now we look at our old columns. This has overall rank. We look at new columns and this has all caps rank. Perfect. Now what we do is we set df copy dot columns and we can just assign this. We can just say, okay, hey, I want to change this. I want this to equal new columns. And let's, let's take a look before. So, all right, so we have overall rank in there right now. Now we run this assignment and now we look at dfcopy.columns and there you go. Column name has changed. Perfect. So let's go through and delete all of this experimentation here. So what we want to do is we want to say new 2015 column names equals Let's create a list. So country, do we want to map country to a different name? Yes, we do. We want this to now equal country or region. Region, do we want to map this to a different name? Well, our 2019 data doesn't have region uh, and we want to keep it. So no, we'll just keep this as region. Happiness rank, well, this is just overall rank in the 2019 data that we want to match the columns with. Happiness score is just score. Let's keep going. Standard error. This is another column that we don't have in the 2019 data, so we can keep that column name the same. That's totally fine. Economy, GDP per capita. Well, in our 2019 data, this is just GDP per capita. Uh, family, this is gonna be mapped to social support here social support and uh, health life expectancy is going to get mapped to healthy life expectancy freedom is going to get mapped to freedom to make life choices trust government corruption is going to get mapped to perceptions of corruption Generosity stays the same as generosity. Dystopia, dystopia residual stays the same as dystopia residual. And year stays the same. All right. Now if we do DFS 2015.columns equals new 2015 column names, 
Now let's see what happens when we try to concatenate the 2019 data with the 2015 data. Let's take a look here. All right, so look, overall rank. And uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and pass in this whole ignore index equals true. Overall rank looks like it got matched up. Country or region looks like it matched up. Score, da, 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 da. all these are looking good. And then you get down here to the very end and you see three where the 2019 data did not match. And this is exactly what we expected, right? Uh, 2019 does not have region data, 2019 does not have standard error data, and 2019 does not have dystopia residual. So we just figured out a way to concatenate the 2019 data with the 2015 by changing the 2015 column names to match up with the 2019 column names. And now if we add the 2018 data in here as well, check this out. Now we have 470 rows and we have all these same columns again. So this is gonna be our new DF concat and we have data from three years now, which is super cool. All right, so we have combined data for the years 2019, 2018, and 2015. And uh, we might not add in the data for 2017 and 2016 in this video just because that's an exercise that you can do yourself uh, to, to work with this whole column mapping thing. I think that, you know, it's one thing to watch someone do it, but it's another thing to have to figure it out yourself. So, um, by the way, I want to take this opportunity to encourage you at any point to pause the video and play with things yourself and try to figure it out before I show you how I would do it. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely trying to give you a crash course in pandas here, but not all of this is going to stick the first time. And you're definitely going to learn more of it the more that you play around with pandas yourself. So if you want to pause the video at any point and try to figure it out before I show you, then please do that. And uh, otherwise, you know, feel free to keep following along and you'll learn, you'll learn as you go. All right, let's move on to question, question number nine. Now that we have our combined data question, let's see, question number nine. All right, so you'll notice that let's, uh, let's take a look at our DF concat here. So we have region in some of our data, you know, specifically the 2015 data, but we don't have region in the 2019 and 2018 data. So this region, you know, this is just mapping countries to region. I think it'd be interesting to look at all of our data by this region. So let's ask that question. Can, uh, let's see, it looks like we have region data for some of our data but not, uh, let's see, for 2015, but not for 2018 or 2019. Is there a way to bring in region data for the years where we don't have it? Well, I'm glad you asked because this brings us to a couple of different ways that we could do this. So. I'll talk about way number one really quick, which is the way that we're not going to do. And um, this is using the map function. So I will, I'll show you this actually with uh, DF concat. Let's take a look at year. So whenever you have a pandas series and you want to transform one value into another, this map function can come in handy. So let's let's see, let's take a look at the documentation for map. So you basically pass in a function um, and uh, this function is applied to each value in this column. 
and it returns a new pandas series. So what we're doing here is we're passing in a function or a mapping. Um, let's see, what is this? This is, yeah, func computes the function using the arguments. So you can pass in a function or a mapping. And just to show you kind of what I mean by that, so our year, we have 2019, 2018, and 2015, right? Well, what if I wanted to map the year, uh, let's say what if I wanted to do 2019, maybe I want to spell it out. I want to say 2019 and 2018, I want to spell out, you know, 2018. So what I could do here is I could create a dictionary. I'll call this, you know, year mapping dictionary. And I'm going to say, hey, I want to map, uh, I want to map the year 2019 as my key to this other string as my value, and I want to map the year 2018 as a key to 2018 as my value, and lastly with 2015, 2015. So we have this dictionary that maps one value as the key to another value as the dictionary value. And if we pass this in to our map function, then this is going to do the work for us of taking 2019 and mapping it to the string 2019. And it's gonna take this string 2015, and it's going to map it to this 2015. So if we define a mapping from inputs to outputs, then we can pass that to our dot map function here and get out a new, uh, get out a new column. And just to show you what that would look like, let's make a, let's make a new DF copy, um, DF copy, let's say DF concat dot copy. And so maybe what I'll do is I will I'll create a new column here and I'll say, you know, DF copy uh, year string. And now let's take a look at DF copy. And there you go. So we did a mapping using our dictionary, our mapping dictionary here, and we added it back as a column. So we could use this logic if we wanted to, remember I said that we're not gonna go this direction right now, but we could use this kind of thinking to say, <clears throat> to say, okay, we have the country of Rwanda. Let's take Rwanda and let's map it to Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa. And let's take Syria and let's map Syria to the Middle East and Northern Africa. And now, if I call this instead, you know, region mapping dictionary, then if I look at DF copy country or region, and I map using this dictionary, now we've only mapped two of the countries and that's why you're gonna see NANs all these other places. But you will notice that for rows 465 and 467, we did map Rwanda and Syria to their respective regions. And so we could also do the same for Finland, for Denmark, for Norway. We could do that and that would fill in all of the NANs for 2019 and 2018. But now we'd have to construct this dictionary and you know that'd be a pretty big dictionary. It'd have like 150 keys and, um, and we just don't want to do that right now because this is an opportunity and I'm gonna go ahead and delete all this now. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show this to you because this mapping, this mapping is something that comes up a lot, comes up all the time. So just wanted you to see a glimpse of that really quickly. So I'm gonna delete all that using the X key. It's one of my favorite Jupyter Notebook keyboard shortcuts to delete cells. All right, so why don't I wanna do that? 
Well, I don't want to do that because this is an opportunity to show you how to do SQL style table joins, SQL style kind of database table joins in pandas. So if you do data analysis, if you do data science, there's a good chance that you have worked with SQL before, or if you've only worked with it a little bit, there's a good chance that you know what SQL table joins are. This is essentially taking, do, 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 do. you know, there aren't really a lot of good images here, but um, it's taking one table of data and using a key that matches up with another table of data to bring in some additional information. So w let's just work through it. And, and for those of you who know what SQL table joins are, you know, this will click immediately. And for those of you who don't, maybe you'll be able to see how that works, but um, you know, we're not, we're not going to spend necessarily a ton of time on it. So this is done using the PD dot merge function, merge function. And so what do we want? Well, let's, let's map it out. Let's kind of think about it here, right? We have country and we want to bring in region for all of the places where it's missing. So we need some kind of way to map countries to regions. And we have this data for 2015. We have this data for 2015. So let's actually take a look at this data for 2015. So I am going to filter this down to just the country and the region uh, columns. And the way I'm going to do that, you've seen the bracket notation where we can say, you know, country or region, and that returns a panda series. Well, if we add another bracket in here, so if we add, if, if we pass in a list, if we pass in a list of column names, then this returns a data frame with just the columns that you passed in. So we have country or region, and we have region. These are just the two columns that we want. Now, what if I actually call, what if I call this one right here, region mapping data frame? So I'll call this region mapping data frame. Because that's what this is, right? This is now a data frame that maps country to region. So if we take a look at the, you know, the first few rows of our DF concat up here, well, we don't have region for this data, but take, take a look at the second row here, Denmark. Because of the 2015 data, we now know that Denmark maps to Western Europe, right? So if we're thinking about this in terms of SQL table joins, we want to match this column, the country or region column, to the DF concat country or region column, and we want to bring in region here. So the way that we're going to do that is we have our region mapping data frame. We are going to say pd.merge. Let's take a look at the documentation. We have our left table that we want to join on. We have our right table that we want to join on. We have how we want to do it. So the default is an inner join. We want to do a left join because some of our countries might not map to regions, and we don't want to drop those if that happens. And then we have essentially how do we want or, or what do we want to join on. So you can either specify a single join column if the join column is the same in the left table and the right table. Or you can specify left on, right on. You can specify if you want to join on the index, et cetera, et cetera. So let's do this. So we want to join our DF concat. That's our left. We'll explicitly call it left here just to be explicit. Our right is our region mapping data frame. How do we want to join? Well, we want to do a left join. And if you don't know what that is, Google you know, SQL left join. <coughs> and what do we want to join on? We want to join on country or region. Now what happens if we do this? Let's close this out. So now you'll see 
our data frame looks very much the same, right? Except for that our region column now, our old region column, and you can know that you can tell that this is the old one because it's still got all these NANs here for the uh, for the 2019 data, has this suffix of an X, and we just brought in a new region column. We just joined this in, and this has a suffix of Y, and this is coming from the region mapping table. And look that we have just mapped all of these countries to their region where we didn't have before. So that is super cool. And you'll notice that down here, all of our region mappings for 2015 that we would expect to stay the same have stayed the same. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa still maps to Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East still maps to Middle East, etc. So now what we can do really is, is we could drop this old region column and just go with a new one. Um, but to make, uh, to make our lives a little bit easier, to make our lives a little bit easier, why don't we drop the region column in DF concat before we join, and then we'll just bring in this single new region column here. So to take a look at what that looks like, we're going to say DF concat. Now to drop a column, it's pretty easy. You say dot drop, and then you say columns equals the columns that you want to drop. So in this case, we just want to drop a... Uh, we just want to drop a region. And uh, by the way, just like all the other things we've been working with, this did not alter either one of these two data frames. This returned a new data frame. And if we want to work with it, we would need to capture it here, something like that. So, but we're not going to do that just yet. So our DF concat, if we look at that, this has region over here. Let's go ahead and drop that. And we're going to set it equal to itself again so that we capture that altered data frame. Now we look at DF concat. Region is gone. Perfect. Now we do this DF concat with region. Let's, let's set it equal to that. And so now this is joining our left table is DF concat uh, with the region column dropped. Our right table is the region mapping data frame, which we constructed using the 2015 data frame here. We're doing a left join. We're joining on country or region. Let's take a look at our final results. Da, 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 da. There you go. We have a single region column, and we have now mapped all of our country data to have a region using pandas, which is a pretty sweet. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here, and let's ask a let's ask a question nine B. And the the question that I'm wondering is, you know, we just joined in these regions for our countries, but are there any regions that uh, that didn't match up essentially? So this is maybe more of like a data quality question. You know, this isn't necessarily um, something, I guess, you know, bringing in the region data here isn't necessarily a question about the data itself either. So, you know, this is fine. Uh, so are there any regions that didn't match up here? Well, this is a chance to show you uh, one of actually a couple of my favorite pandas methods here. The first one, so let's look at DF concat with region. Let's look at that there. And I'm going to change this to dot head up here just to save a little bit of space. Um, let's even do dot head like two or something like that. All right. So we look at our region. And the handy dandy method that I want to show you right now is dot is in a now this is going to return a boolean uh a series a panda series of all booleans we could think about this as a boolean mask if we want where this is um this is no region id access so these are the indexes where there is no region, or this is a this is a Boolean mask, I, I guess I could say. So we could say no region mask or something like that. Um, so if we look then at the rows where this is true, 
so we actually we do have some rows still. Um, another way that we could look at this is if we did no region mask dot sum, this would convert all of the true values to ones essentially, and then add them up. So we have thirteen rows where region is in a. So we just showed a couple things there. This is in a method, which creates a boolean mask as to whether or not the region column is nan here is uh, you know not a number or basically null if we want to see how many of those that's true for then we can just do dot sum and that counts up the true values and then if we want to look at what those rows actually are we can use this boolean mask to index into our data frame here and look at just these rows so and what does this mean well, it means that, uh, let's see, what, what year is this? 2019 and 2018. So there are some countries or regions that existed in 2019 and 2018 that existed in the data that did not exist in the 2015 data. So Trinidad and Tobago, Northern Cyprus, North Macedonia. You know, I, I don't necessarily know the history of these places, maybe they didn't have data in 2015 or maybe they weren't officially called these in 2015 or you know something like that so either way there is no region for this data so this is something that we're not necessarily going to do anything with right now but it's just good to know that for these countries we do not have their region and this might come into play in just a minute whenever we start looking at some of this data by region so with that, this leads me to the final question of this section here. Let's do question number 10. Now that we have a nice combined data set, how do we write it back out to a file for later usage? So, you know, let's say that we were to, we were to save this Jupyter notebook, we were to shut it down, and at some point in the future, we wanted to come back in and look at the, the combined data here with the region joined in. Well, it would be kind of annoying if we had to come back in here and rerun all of these cells. It wouldn't take very long because we could just rerun everything from the, from the beginning probably. But what would be nicer is if we had this data frame as, or sorry, not, not this data frame, but if we had the DF concat with region data frame, saved out as a CSV file or something that we could load in later much faster. Pandas makes this very easy. We just do dot, I'm gonna start typing TO and then hit tab. And you can see all the things that we can export this as. So the one that we want right here to CSV. Let's take a look at the doc string for this. So once again, we got a ton of parameters that we could work with, but you know we're only gonna look at the first couple here. The main one is the file path that we want to pass it. So I'm just going to pass it. Uh, why don't we call this combined happiness score data dot CSV. And there's one other option that I'm going to pass here, this index. Um, so the index, you remember, as we're working with it currently, is just these numbers. Um, it's just kind of a count, it, you know, it's just a numeric range. It doesn't really provide a lot of value. Normally, pandas writes this index out as a new column, but in our case, the index doesn't add a lot of value. We don't want to write it out. We're going to set this equal to false. So I can go ahead and run this. And now if we run ls to see what's in this directory, um, we will see that the combined happiness score data.csv is right there from us writing it out um, just now with the dot to CSV method. All right, so that wraps up section number two here. Um, so let's move on to our third section, our final section. And uh, let's see, section number two, concatenating multiple data sets and working with them that way. And then section number three is gonna be working with our new data 
from multiple years. And there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do here now that we have all of our data in this DF concat with region data frame. So let's start with our first question here, which is question number 11, I believe. How many countries do we have per region? And uh, this, this actually, you know, this is maybe cheating a little bit again because this doesn't, this doesn't actually relate to the data from multiple years here. Um, as a matter of fact, we're probably going to want to filter this data down to just one year. But, but uh, this is going to use one of my favorite pandas methods, and that is the value counts method. So the value counts method, what this is going to do is let me show you on year first before we look at countries per region. So if we take our DF concat with region here, and we just look at the year column. So we have this panda series, and this panda series is going to give us one value per row. So you see we got a bunch of 2019s, a bunch of 2015s. Uh, we know that 2018 is in the middle here. What if I wanted to ask the question, how many rows do we have for each one of these years? This is where value counts comes in. So we do dot value counts. And this is going to create essentially a counter, kind of like a word count, of how many times does this value show up. So we see here that for the year 2015, we have 158 rows. For the year 2019, we have 156 rows. And then for the year um, 2018, we have 156 rows as well. So we want to do the same basic thing with region. What we want to do is we want to say, okay, let's uh, you know, let's take our data frame here. Let's look at region. And then if we do value counts, this is going to count up the number of rows per region. But if we do this right now, this is not the number of countries per region. And why is that? Well, that's because we have three years, right? So the country Finland is going to show up three times probably, which means that if Finland is in, you know, where would this be, like Western Europe or something like that, um, if Finland is in that category, it's going to get counted three times. So we're actually multiplying this by approximately a factor of three. And I say approximately because, remember, we have some countries that are different between different years. So to get around that, what we'll do is let's go ahead and delete this cell. And then we'll look at DF concat with region. Let's go ahead and filter down to one year. And maybe let's filter down to the year 2019. So what we're going to do is just like before, we set this equal to 2019. That creates a Boolean mask. And actually, it looks like, uh, it looks like this first row is coming up false here. Maybe we need to set this equal to the string. There we go. So this is something you know that could trip you up, is we were setting it equal to a number before. And the first row is coming up false whenever we look up here and we say, hey, wait, you know, that should be, that should be true because uh, that year is 2019. But if we look at, let's use one of the things we learned earlier, let's look at the D type of this panda series. And you'll see D type O here, O standing for object. And if we look at the D types for the full data frame, then you can see down here, year is indeed object data type. So it's not a number. Uh, it's going to be a string. And we can verify that by if we look at year, and then we do dot iloc zero to grab that first row there. You see this comes up in quotes. And we do type. And that's a type string. So you know, I just walked you through very briefly how you could maybe go about troubleshooting something like this. If you're getting unexpected results, make sure to check your types. Um, okay, let's delete that. So we're going to set this equal to the string. Now we are going to filter df concat with region by this Boolean mask here. So the if we look at year and then... We just see 2019 showing up here. 
and I'll show you another little attribute that is handy dandy called dot unique. And this is going to show you the unique values. So we can see here that whenever we filter the data frame down to just the 2019 uh, rows, and then we look at the year column, and then we ask for the unique values, we only get 2019, which is exactly what we would expect. Um, versus if we look at DF concat with region year dot unique. Well, we've got we've got three years in here. All right. So all of that gets us now to this point where rather than year, let's do region. So here are all of our regions. And then let's do value counts. And there we go. We see that we have 36 countries or regions in sub-Saharan Africa. We've got 28 in Central and Eastern Europe. Europe. We have 20 in Latin America and the Caribbean, 20 in Western Europe, all the way down to Australia and New Zealand has two, which is funny because that's probably just Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> all right. So we see how many countries we have per region. And if we wanted a quick way of looking at how many regions we have, well, we can do this same operation here, but then let's do dot, you know, we did dot unique before. Now we're going to do dot in unique. So the number unique, and that gives us 10, 10 unique regions. And if we ask the question, is this the same as the number of unique regions for the full data set dot in unique? Yep, it is. So we have 10 regions in the full data set, and we have 10 data uh, regions in just the 2019 data. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense because we're getting these regions from just one year, which is the 2015 data. So unless a region were to be left out of the 2019 data, we would expect to see the same number of regions. So you just learned a lot in this little question here lot to digest. Um, definitely, you know, like I said before, feel free to pause the video at any point, play around with things yourself, dig into it a little bit yourself, but let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and move on. Question number 12. Question number 12. What is the average happiness score by region? So we're kind of following this logical train of thought, right? Like we're you know, we're getting, we're getting data, we're looking at some of the averages, or we're looking at, at the happiness scores here, where um, we're starting to look at the number of countries per region. Uh, now maybe we want to look at the average happiness score by region. And we could calculate this a couple different ways. We could calculate it for all of the years, or we could calculate it for just a single year. Let's calculate it for all of the years right now. So let's think about how to do this. So if we look at DF concat with region, let's look at our region column, but we also want to bring in our score column, right? So I'm going to do the thing that we did before. And instead of passing in just a single string, we're going to pass in a list to the data frame. And I'm going to pass in score as well so that we get that happiness score per region. And now remember that each one of these rows is going to be a country, and it's also going to be a country by year. So this row in particular, what is this row? That's, uh, that's Finland in the year 2019. So just a reminder of what exactly we're looking at there. So to find the average happiness score by region, uh, if you know SQL or if you know pivot tables in Excel, this is going to be a group by operation here. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be grouping by region. So we're going to say, hey, I want to do a calculation for each region. So I'm going to group by region. And now if I run this, you'll see that this just returns this pandas core group by data frame group by object. So nothing super useful yet. What we want to do is we want to take this group by object and then we apply some kind of aggregation to it. So this is grouping our data by region 
and then we want to look at the average happiness score so we can do dot mean so dot mean here and there we go you see this score and you see the region so the region is what we're grouping by so pandas go uh pandas takes region and sets it as our index here and then we take the mean and then pandas knows okay you know for for australia and new zealand well i've got two data points uh, per year i've got three years so this is going to be six different data points here how do you want me how do you want me to aggregate those six different data points and we tell pandas hey i want you to take the average i want you to take the mean of those six data points so this data frame here is going to give us our average happiness score by region so maybe i will set this equal to a new variable here average happiness by region all right so we have our average happiness score by region but uh but it, it wasn't sorted here if we look at this again you know it's not sorted it's hard to tell which one of these is the greatest which one is the least so what if we want to sort these values well we can use the dot sort values method that we used earlier uh, if we just run this by itself you notice that it's going to throw a type error here missing one required positional argument by so let's set by equals to score this is going to sort ascending if we want to sort descending we can just set ascending equals false and now we get to see our regions by the average happiness score so australia new zealand coming in first here north america right after that and then western europe latin america and the caribbean and then down here at the bottom, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. So what if we wanted to make this a little bit more visual? Well, we, we looked at dot plot earlier, and there's no reason why we can't throw a dot plot here as well. So if we run this by itself, this is going to plot kind of this funky line chart thing, and all the labels are overlapped. Um, if we if we do a bar chart though which i think looks a little nicer and uh and pandas automatically reorients the labels to be vertical there so then we can kind of see you know we can see a little bit more of the relationship like visually humans are really good at visuals we're not quite as good at raw numbers so whenever we can plot things visually that can definitely help and uh you know here we see that same relationship again and uh, we get to see the difference between these different groups and you can almost see like three different categories emerging you've got this kind of middle category here that looks a little uh, it's got a bit of a plateau you have these two down here which are a little bit lower and then these three up here which are a little bit higher so that might be one logical way for us to group these regions if we wanted to do so now moving on to question 13 this is going to be a kind of a similar spin on the same exact question here what is the average happiness score over time what's the average happiness score over time look like so if we go back to our original df concat with region and we do a group by group by and i'm going to show you actually this time how to do the group by with the full data frame so let's look at the the group by with the full data frame on region now what happens if we do mean what happens if we do mean well if we do mean we have a lot of numeric columns in our original data frame that we can take the mean of oh and i, I think i meant to group this by year so let's group that by year um so we have a lot of numeric columns in our original data that we can take the mean of so pandas takes the mean of all of them grouped by year so if we just want the score then we can go about that two different ways we can put the score here before we calculate the mean or we can put the score here after we calculate the mean and it you know maybe kind of confusingly why why can we do that both ways well it's kind of just the way that pandas works um 
you usually have a couple different ways that you can do things. So let's let's uh, let's just do it this way for now. We'll calculate the mean first, and then we'll do the score after. And we'll say that this is we'll say that this is average happiness by year. And let's set that equal there. Now, if we look at this by year. 2015, 2018, 2019. So our years are currently sorted. So that's looking good. What happens if we plot this kind equals bar? Well, there we go. You know, we see 2015, 2018, 2019. These look almost identical to each other. And if we if we go back to the original data, we see that, yeah, actually these are, you know, these are almost identical, 5.37, 5.37, 5.4. So not a ton of change over time, but you know, this is only four years and it's going up a tiny little bit. So maybe, you know, maybe that's, that's some good news right there. All right, moving on here to question number 14. We're getting close to the end here. So let's, let's start, uh, you know, let's try some tricky things here. So Let's ask the question, you know, we, we just discovered that Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest average happiness score. Um, and we know that Europe and, and Western Europe in particular has a pretty high score. So let's ask the question, um, how many countries in Africa, and maybe we'll combine Sub-Saharan, Sub-Saharan, uh, and northern slash the Middle East here. So we're gonna we're gonna clump the Middle East in here so that we get northern Africa as well, since that's that's uh, let's see which this this region region right here, Middle East and northern Africa. How many countries in Africa have a happiness score higher than the lowest score in Western? Europe. And we could we could look at this as an average over the last, you know, several years, um, but maybe we actually want to ask this question just specifically about 2019. So let's say in 2019, how many countries in Africa had a happiness score higher than the lowest score in Western Europe? So we're looking for the lowest score in Western Europe, and then we're asking the question, how many countries in Africa had a happiness score higher than than that so um and with each of these questions by the way feel free to pause the video and see if you can figure out the answer you know before before i show you how to do it so see if you can figure this out on your own especially if you're fairly new to pandas that can be that can be a very good learning experience learn through doing you know so okay so let's let's ask this in a in a couple parts here. So we'll maybe say question number 14A. What was the lowest happiness score in Western Europe in 2019? All right. So we have our DF concat with region. Let's filter this down to 2019. So we'll do DF concat with region 2019. All right. So, and, you know, let's go ahead and si assign this to a variable right now. And I, I know that we could go back to our data that we had earlier because we had 2019 already split out, but we've got our region data in here. And, you know, I'm just going to use this for right now. So let's call this 2019. All right. 2019 now we want we want the region of western europe here so let's do region equals western europe all right western europe 2019 okay so now if we look at this data set we should see that we only have western europe and it looks like we do so that's looking pretty good and now we want to find the lowest happiness score. So I believe that this is already sorted, but you know, if we presume that it's not, then let's look at the score and let's get the min. 
And the minimum there is, you know, 5.287. And if we go back to our data here, then we do see that, okay, Greece down here at the bottom, 5287. So this does look sorted. We could do a dot tail, which is kind of the opposite of dot head. And look at the last row here. So this is going to be Greece down here with a score of 5.287. All right, so lowest, so we could say uh, lowest happiness score, or actually maybe let's call this West, uh, Western Europe lowest score. Western Europe lowest score, and we can say that this is 5.287. So we'll set that equal to that. All right. So now moving on to question number 14B. And this is how many uh, how many countries in Africa had a happiness score higher than that? Okay. So we go back to our, 20, uh, our DF 2019 here. So we're just going to want to look at the Sub-Saharan African region as well as the Middle East and Northern Africa region. So let's take a look at our regions here again. Let's get dot unique. So if we, if we uh, set, let's say, African regions and let's create... Uh, you know, we can just create. We can just create a list here, or we could create a set. Either way, but let's just create a list for right now. And we will say that our African regions are the Middle East and Northern Africa, since those are grouped together. And we have Sub-Saharan Africa here. All right. So we have our African regions, and now we want to filter our data down to just those. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, this is where our handy dandy map function can come in. So remember that earlier we talked about, you know, if we wanted to, we could map the, the number 2019, even though this is a string, we could map 2019 to some string if we want, like 2019. Well, we can also use this kind of mapping to create a, a custom Boolean mask that meets the requirements that we want. So in this case, we want region. We want region to just be in, you know, one of these two. So what we can do is we can say, okay, dot map. And if you're not familiar with Lambda functions, I'm going to throw this out here and you might need to do a little bit of research, but a Lambda function is essentially a way in Python for you to create a function on the fly. And the way that you do that is you say lambda, so I want, I want a function here. I want the input of that function to be x, and specifically that x is going to be this region data that we're passing in um, from this panda series. And then you put a colon, and then you say, what do you want to do with x? Well, in this case, we just want to check x in African regions. So this is doing a Boolean kind of check here, you know, if we were to go just take a look at that down here, we could say, oh, is the letter A in African regions? Um, and that's going to say false. And that might be actually be misleading because you're like, well, hey, there is the letter A. It's right there, you know. But we're checking the whole string here. So I could say, you know, is is uh, A in African regions? That's false. But now if I check to say, hey, is the Middle East and Northern Africa in African regions? Well, that is, that's true, that's true. So for each value in this Panda series, we are passing it to this custom, this Lambda function that we're just defining right now. We're passing in that input X. This is kind of the standard is to use X here, but we could say, you know, Lambda region, and we could do region in X, or uh, sorry, region in African regions. And so we're gonna go through this whole series and we are going to check to see if region is in African regions. And now if we do that, we get this Boolean mask here. And now 
if we use this Boolean mask to filter our data frame, you will see here that we only have Middle East and Northern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have successfully filtered our data to just the African, Northern African and Middle Eastern countries here. So I am going to set this equal to DF African countries. There we go. So what do I want to do now? Well, I want to answer our question of how many countries in Africa had a higher score than this Western European low score. So let's take a look at our data. So we have our score column here. And what we can do is we can we can use this same uh, this same kind of, you know, we could we could take our score and we could multiply it by a hundred or we can check to see if our score is within a certain range. And in this case, we want to check to see if our score is greater than Western Europe lowest score. So whenever we do this, this pandas series here is going to compare every score to this float. And it's going to create, once again, that Boolean pandas series. So here we go. And since our score is sorted, you'll see that the top ones here are true and these bottom ones are false. Now at this point, if we just wanted to get our score, well, we could wrap this expression in parentheses to say, okay, give me this panda series and take the sum of this series and here is our answer, nine. So nine countries in Africa and Northern Africa and the Middle East had a higher happiness score than the lowest happiness score in Western Europe. And if we wanted to look at what those countries were, well, let's take this Boolean mask here that we end up with and let's pass it back into African countries. And here we go. So you'll see actually that the majority of these are in the Middle East and Northern Africa, Israel, the UAE, Saudi Arabia. Um, you get down here to Sub-Saharan Africa and you get Mauritius here, which is, I might be, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Mauritius, Mauritius, Mauritius. I'm not sure. I should look that up. And you get that that is the only country in Sub-Saharan Africa with a higher happiness score than the lowest score in Western Europe. So we just answered that question and it took a few steps here, but we got to it and um, feeling pretty good about that. All right, let's go ahead and move on. All right, if you've made it this far, I would consider that a huge success. Um, these next few things that we're gonna do here are definitely bonus territory. Uh, it's going to, you know, might get a little bit more complicated, might introduce uh, just a couple extra things here. But like I said, if you made it this far, congratulations. Uh, I think you've just learned a ton about pandas, but let's keep going. Consider all of this bonus material. So let's go to question number 15 here. Can we look at the change in average happiness levels by region over time, over time. So what we're interested in here is, you know, let's take a region like Sub-Saharan Africa and let's look at that average happiness score over time. So over 2015, uh, 2018 and 2019 are the three years that we currently have in our data set. So how would we do that? Well, once again, if you have some background with SQL uh, or with pivot tables, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is, this is the same group by that we did earlier. You know, previously we did group by region, but now we're just adding a second level. We're adding another level to our group by, and that is kind of where I would recommend us uh, looking. So DF concat with region. So we're going to group by, and this time instead of grouping by a single by a single column by region or by year, 
And remember that we, you know, we did something like this here. So we group by region. We look at the score column and then we say, you know, we've got a few data points. You know, if we're grouping by region, we're going to get a bunch of rows. Um, we're looking at the score. How do we want to aggregate that? Well, we want to look at the average. So we take the mean. So now, rather than just grouping by a single column, let's pass in a list. Let's pass in a list with region. And first, I'm going to pass in year as well. So we're going to group by region and group by year. Let's take a look at what this returns. All right, look at that. So what we have here is this is called a multi-index. So previously, you saw how this, you know, this bolded thing here, this is the index that we can index by. Well, you can also have multiple levels in your index, and this is what's going to happen whenever you group by multiple things is pandas is going to return you know here is your single column of data and here are the two indices that we're grouping by here first your uh, your first level over here is is year and your second one is region so technically we've answered the question or we could answer the question if we were to manually go through and take a look at each one of these regions. So let's take a look at, you know, Australia and New Zealand, for instance. 7.28 goes to 7.29. So it goes up slightly from 2015 to 2018 and then goes to 7.26. So it actually uh, kind of drops back down there in 2019. So this might technically answer the question, but I think that there's a better way that we can look at this here. And to do that, we're going to introduce one more method here. And um, we're going to try to plot this. And sometimes, you know, sometimes plotting with just pandas can get a little tricky. And this is definitely where experimentation comes in handy. Uh, or if you know matplotlib really well or Seaborn, you know, definitely go ahead and, and plot things using that. But Let's, what if we just try to call dot plot on this like we might want to before? And what if we do, you know, kind equals bar? Well, here we've, you know, we're plotting the region and it looks like we're plotting the year as well, but we've got, a, we've got an individual bar for every year and region and they're all just kind of laid out flat here. You know, this is a year region combination. So this isn't quite what we want. I'm I'm kind of envisioning I'm kind of envisioning each each region gets its own set of bars and then maybe we look at, you know, each year as a different bar within that region or something like that. So what we're going to do here to help facilitate this is we're going to use this dot unstack method. And dot unstack, let's let's take a look at what the documentation tells us here for that. So using our handy dandy question mark syntax to get the documentation. Oh, sorry, dot unstack, dot unstack. There we go. All right, so you see that dot unstack takes in two parameters, level and fill value. And what, is, what does it do? Well, it pivots a level of the necessarily hierarchical index labels. So it returns a data frame having a new level of column labels whose innermost level consists of the pivoted index labels. So this is kind of confusing, but basically what we're saying here, what that pandas documentation is saying is we're going to take one of these indices and we're going to turn it into columns. We're going to turn it into columns. So let's take a look at just what unstack does by itself. All right, so unstack by itself is going to take the region uh, index. So that was kind of our inner index there. And it's going to turn that into a column. So now we have this one index running down the side, which is year. Our columns are now our regions. And what happens if we plot kind equals bar for this? 
All right, so this is giving us kind of the, you know, a little bit of the opposite of what we wanted. This is giving us a cluster of years and plotting each region there, but we can't easily see the change over time here. So let's, let's back out a little bit. Let's back out. So unstack takes in this level parameter. Now the default level was, was negative one there. So um, let's see what happens if we pass in some different numbers for level. So level is equals zero. Now this is going to do the opposite. This is going to take your year index and make that your column. So we've kind of pivoted the year up to the top here and we've kept the region down as our index. And if we do level equals one, you'll see that this is the same as the default unstack functionality. So let's take level equals zero. Now we've got year as all of our columns. Now what happens if we do plot kind equals bar? There we go, look at that. So now we have region along our x-axis and we go 2015, 2018, 2019 are the blue, orange, and green bars here. Can we pass in a little fig size equals, you know, let's do like a, well, let's try it like a 12 by 12, see what happens. All right, that's a little big maybe. Let's do a 10 by 10. Still a little big, but that's okay. So now we can see the change for each region over time. And if we look at Central and Eastern Europe, for example, look at this score going up pretty steadily there. Um, if we look at the Middle East and Northern Africa, this score has actually kind of been decreasing over time. And re remember that we are, we're are we jumping a few years here. So this would be really cool to look at with the 2016 and 2017 data as well. So like I said, that's your it's part of your homework assignment if you want to keep diving into this. Um, but this is a cool way now that we can look at the change in average happiness levels by region over time. All right, let's do one final question here just because we're on a roll. Our brains are probably leaking out of our ears by now, but um, you know, we've got we got one more in us, one more in us. So question, oop, let's see, go back up here. Question number 16. Which countries had their score change um or let's let's say more specifically increase the most over time so we're looking for positive happiness score movement here so how do we do that all right let's go back to our df concat with region so we're going to be looking at countries you know country or region and we're going to be looking at score and we're going to be looking at the score by year so this is a kind of a classic example of maybe what we might think of as an Excel pivot table. So we have our country and our, our region, we have our score and we have our year. And we want to look at, or I guess I should say one way to solve this is with kind of a classic pivot table approach. So maybe we wanna take this year and flip it to be a column um, where we see, you know, the score for each country by year. So if we're just, if we're not doing any group buys, you know, we're not doing any group buys here and we just want to pivot one of these columns, pandas can help us out here with a handy dandy little pivot table function. So let's do pivot table and let's look at the documentation. So the doc string, all right. So we pass in the values, we pass in the index, we pass in the columns, um, and then if we want, we could pass in an aggregation function, a fill value, all this kind of stuff. So the doc string says create a spreadsheet style pivot table as a data frame, and the levels in the pivot table will be stored in multi-index objects, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so values, this is the column to aggregate, uh, you know, in our case, we're just going to be pivoting. We're not going to be aggregating. Um, but the values are the things that we want in the cells. You know, these are the things that we want in these cells here. The index, well, this is going to be our index. This is going to be our rows. 
uh, and the columns, well, these are going to be our columns. So let's think about what we want. Let's think about what we want here. So let's do dot head on this. DF concat with region dot pivot table. So our values, for our values, well, we really want our score column in here. This is the thing we're going to be looking at. Um, and running down the side, so these are going to be our index. Well, we can probably just keep this as country or region like it looks right now. You know, we, we maybe want our country or our region running down the side. And then across the top, well, we want to pivot our year to be across the top there. So we might say uh, columns equals year. Let's take a look at what this does. All right. So this looks pretty cool. This is doing what we might expect it to do here. Our country or our region is down the side. Our year has now been pivoted to be along the columns here. And each value is the score. So this is looking good. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and assign this to a variable. Maybe we'll call this... Um, DF countries over time or something like that. So then to see to see the change, the score change between 2019 and 2015, well, this can be just as simple as getting the score for 2019. Let's get the score for 2019 for each country. And let's subtract the score for 2015. So we're finding the difference in scores here from 2015 to 2019. And here is our resulting value. You'll see that we maybe have some NANs in here because maybe maybe these countries don't have data for 2019 or for 2015. Let's set this equal to a new column in our data frame. So DF countries over time. And we can say, uh, we'll just call this Maybe we'll just call this difference. We'll just call it difference for right now. And now if we look at our data frame, let's do dot head, you'll see that we have that difference stored in a column. So what's the question that we're trying to ask? The question is which countries had their score increase the most over time? So what we wanna do is we want to sort this difference column. So let's sort values by equals we want to sort by difference and we want to sort ascending equals ascending equals false we want to sort descending and here you go here's our answer the country of Benin followed by the Ivory Coast and Togo had the largest positive increases in the happiness score over time. So that is pretty cool. Congratulations to these top three countries um, on making such big gains here. That's pretty cool. Uh, what if we wanted to look at what region these countries were in? Well, if we go back to our pivot table, uh, that's along our index here. This is actually just as simple as adding another thing to our index. So rather than passing in a string, let's pass in a list and just like whenever we did that group by, we're just going to pass in two columns here. So now along our index, we want to have region and country. So let's do that. And if we look at our data really quickly just to see what it did, there you go. So we have a multi-index where this outer level is the region and this inner level is the country. We still have our years across the top. And uh, if we do these calculations again, there we go. Everything worked just fine. We just now also have the region. And in this case, you can see actually that these top three countries are all in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's kind of an interesting result to end on here, which is that although Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest average score per all these regions, some of these countries are also seeing the biggest positive gains. So 
maybe a little bit of a bright spot there to end on. That's pretty cool. And this is an example of the type of real world, practical, important analysis that you can do with pandas in Python. So with that, I'm going to end here really quickly with maybe a little bit of homework for you. So number one, find your own data set to play with. Um, finding a data set that you're interested in is definitely going to be one of the best ways to learn. So find a data set that you're interested in playing with. Uh, homework number two is if you want to keep playing with this data set, um, see about getting 2016 and 2017 data into our data frame and take a look at what those trends over time look like. So, and you know what, maybe I'll actually, I'll save this find your own data set to play with for the very end. That'll be kind of the last, the last fun thing there. So homework number one, see about getting 2016 and 2017 data into our data frame. Homework bit number two, join in some additional data to this data set using pd.merge. For example, population data. Um, so this is definitely something that you might do a lot in data science is take a, take a basic data set like this and then join in, you know, enrich your data with some external data set. So go out there, find some population data, and then join that in here and do your analysis and see what you come up with. And then here's our last little homework piece here. Find your own data set to play with, do some interesting analyses, and definitely comment if you find something interesting. And there is your homework. All right. I think we are done here. If you've stuck with us all the way, thank you so much. Um, definitely comment with what you liked, what you learned, if you found it valuable, if you think that there's something more that you would like to learn and suggestions for videos that you would like in the future. And with that, I will bid you all adieu. Good luck with your data science learning journeys. And I hope that you have enjoyed learning through doing. Thanks so much. Bye.